have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Rebecca Paisley, a senior geochemist at WSP and geochemical technical lead on various global projects. With a decade of expertise as a geoscientist, Rebecca has been involved in groundbreaking initiatives in DLE technology, geothermal sampling, and lithium exploration. She's an active voice in the industry serving on lithium standards committees and as a non-executive director for Lithium Energy Exploration Inc. Join us as we explore her insights on the future of green energy and lithium innovation. Rebecca, welcome. Thanks for having me. Now, I have to share this. I was, um, I was overhearing, doing a bit of ear hustling. I heard you say, you know what? Talking to me, I, I don't know if I have the most interesting story. I beg to differ. I think that having the, what you call resilience to go through a program of this nature in this type of industry with this type of discipline, I think that you have lots of interesting stories to share. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I would first of all love to hear if you were born to do this or if there was a significant event that shifted your focus that led you down this road, particularly um, in your your educational background, as well as the field that you chose? I mean, I'm I'm a scientist and coldly analytical, I think, deep down. And so as a kid, yeah, I was, you know, the gateway drug for geology is dinosaurs and ah. volcanoes. And, you know, I, the, I apparently said to my friend when I was 13, 14, I was like, I'll go be a volcanologist. And then that's what my PhD was in. I was studying volcanoes for, you know, four, four and a half years. Um, but yeah, in terms of getting into geology, I I knew I was good at geography and I knew I'd like the sciences. And I was like, right, well, let's look at different courses and see what does both. And I fell into earth sciences that way. Um, yeah, always just trying to keep it broad and understand how the earth works. So understanding how the earth works, as well as I think you used the word coldly analytical. Yes. I'd love to understand how you came to that knowledge about yourself. Like, At what point did you know this is me. I am analytical, coldly so, and I'd like to know more about this particular thing, how the earth works. What what led you to that? Um, I think I I went skiing and, you know, hiking and various things as a kid with my family and there's something there's something magical about mountains and oceans and something that's so much bigger than yourself. And I was like, I wanna know how that why is that there? why and so that's kind of yeah how i ended up into into geology it's like how do mountains form how do how do mountains decay you know it's bonkers that people just talk about the fact that all of the continents were like one big continent 250 million years ago you know how how do we know that um and those kind of questions are the ones that I find interesting. Um, what, what keeps it magical for you? Use that term. It was very magical talking about your childhood. What keeps that drive and that interest at this point in life? I like problems. I like solving people's problems. Um, I'm a consultant now, so I get paid to solve people's problems, um, which is fun. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's the challenge of, of trying to answer something that you don't know the answer to or something that I know the answer to that someone else needs help with um, and applying that knowledge. And then you get that little boost. Okay. I succeeded. Some adrenaline pumping there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with some dopamine, maybe that's yeah. great. So talk to us about the program itself. So getting a PhD, being in this industry, I want to hear your personal experiences as well as maybe from a broader perspective, just some things that you would change for the next generation if you were able to do so. Uh, with regards to my PhD or my undergrad? With regards to your PhD, PhD. in the program, yes. Um, I, often people ask me, oh, you know, why did you do a PhD or, or whatever? And I am always brutally honest, and it was I didn't want a real job. I wasn't ready to leave student life. Um, and I applied for a bunch in the UK, and I didn't get any. Um, and then I applied to one in Canada, and I got the offer, and I was like, right, well, I moved to Canada now. Never never stepped foot on North American soil. Um and yeah, and then left four and a half years later. My PhD was was studying volcanoes in Chile in South America, understanding how um, these magmas move up through the surface, 
how they erupt and then how those eruptions change over time and how that's recorded chemically within the rocks themselves. You know, a lot of eruptions aren't seen. You only ever see the rocks. And so the two studies, that the two volcanoes I was studying, was the first time that type of eruption had actually been witnessed in human, you know, human history and recorded on a video camera. Um, and these had happened like five, six years before I joined the program. And so the you know, scientists were like, wait, this is a whole new behavior that we didn't know existed. Um, and my, my program and part of my research was trying to figure out how, you know, why those things are happening. Um, and people then say, you know, when I'm in the industry, it's like, oh, you, you know, how is your PhD in volcanology related to mining? Um, and volcanoes are, they, they concentrate elements. Um, every, pretty much every lithium deposit here has a volcanic origin, be it a, a pegmatite, which is, you know, a, a, a magma that's had all of these elements concentrated up into it, and then it cools down and it propagates and forms a, you know, giant rock within the subsurface. Or a salar, where if you go to the Andes, it's, yes, you have all of those salt flats. The salt flats are in the gaps between the volcanoes. And that, you know, that few times that it rains over the course of tens of thousands of years erodes those waters, those rocks. Lithium loves to be in a solution, and the lithium goes into the salars. And then you've got clay sediments. Clays are just ero eroded volcanoes. You know, Rhyolite Ridge and the McDermott Caldera in, in North America, that's a giant volcano. The caldera you can see from space, and there was a caldera collapse event. Everything went down. I'm, for those who are record listening in, I'm pointing down and forming a, a cone um, with my hands. And, you know, over time, those sediments were... those. Those volcanic rocks were washed away and eroded and formed the sediments that we're now looking for lithium. And that's having that fundamental understanding of the earth often helps you find these deposits. This all sounds very self-directed. So if you look at different disciplines and different ways that disciplines are formed, there are some that are, you know, hand-holding, where you have a map, you know, and from a journalism background, you can ask the questions, who, what, when, where, how. This sounds very self-directed. You're going out and you're perhaps changing course as you're seeing different things with the rocks, with the elements. Is that really um, what this is about? I'm, I'm speaking through it for someone perhaps who's interested in this program, interested in learning more. What can they expect from this type of study? Is it largely self-directed where you're guiding yourself or do you have some sort of blueprint in terms of what to look for, how to understand you know, those rocks and what they're telling you about the time frame and how long they've been around, that sort of thing? Uh, any science or kind of engineering PhD to get the PhD, you have to prove something new, or at least like find something new. You're not there to prove someone else's theory. You're there to find out a piece of information that no one on the planet knows. Um, that's why they take a long time. Um, and that's what academic research is. It's you know pushing these boundaries of things that then trickle down into life. And batteries being a perfect example. They were, they were designed and built in a lab. Um, and so, yes, it's self-directed in a way. A, a lot of PhD programs have an initial broad area. Um, and it, it, again, it depends where you go around the world. Like European PhDs are a bit more focused than um, North American PhDs. But you, go, you often go in to try and find the answer to one question. You come out finding the answer to something else. Um, by bringing the skills that you've learned through your undergrad, master's programs, life experience, um, and pushing the boundaries of science to try and answer something. And I want to compare kind of academic cultures, if you will, in the same way that we talk about corporate culture, there is an academic culture. I know that um, prior to getting the PhD, you were at Oxford University, yes, so um, holds a special place in my heart. <laughs> I was just there last fall, the business school, um, for a leadership um, course at the business school. And I'd like to get your thoughts on academic culture. You know, we've talked a lot about corporate culture. You hear that a lot in the headlines mm -hmm. um, from lawsuits and corporate ethics and corporate governance. 
to social issues that play out in, in the corporations. I'm wondering, in academic life, is there that sort of cultural makeup that is as large as it is in, in corporate life? And if so, what is the culture? So someone who spends a great deal of their life in academia, someone who wants to get to this level, what sort of culture can they expect? And is there a compare and contrast, Oxford to other schools, that you know, to the North American schools? Talk about what culture is in terms of academia. I mean, that could be a podcast in itself. Um, <laughs> I, I think there's a lot of things that are similar, both the good and the bad. You'll have good eggs and bad eggs wherever you go. Um, I think a bigger... A, big difference between academia, particularly if you're a PhD student, not, you know, a professor or a research doctorate where it's effectively a, a job, um, is there's a power dynamic because your PhD supervisor controls your future, essentially, in the sense of, you know, they've got to sign off on your PhD. You have to go through these hoops. And it's not a failure, but often people see it as a failure when people leave a PhD before you get the PhD. And people, you often, you know, you hear people and they're like, I've wasted three years of my life. Because you don't, you don't get that on your, um, your CV. Whereas in a job, if you leave a job because it's toxic, you've got 18 months, two years on your CV and everyone, no one reads that through your CV and we, you know, you, you mentioned before that you've gone through my LinkedIn, but you don't see all of the stories that happened at those times. And I think academia struggles from that a bit more, I'd say, than, than corporate life, so to speak. Um, but it's also, you know, can sometimes be the best years of people's lives. You know, you make friends there, you bond over being stuck in the lab till 1 a.m. because your experiments aren't working. Um, I've done some phenomenal things throughout my PhD. I've traveled to Brazil, China, Chile, you know, kind of wild camped on the side of a volcano, which maybe you wouldn't get to do in industry <laughs> in the same sense. So, um, and I know a lot of people who are still in, in, in academia and they're they're so driven by trying to find something new um, that they, I don't want to say put up with, but put up with the fact that you probably have to move country every 12 to 18 months because you need a, you know, there's only so few places in the world that you can do what you want to do and you're, you're waiting for funding and you're applying for jobs constantly. And I didn't want to do that. Um, and I also, I think research, as, as you mentioned, is that self-directedness and a lot of research in academia is here's a blank page, figure out the question that you're going to answer and then go and answer it. Whereas in industry, problems appear all the time. Exactly. So it's more a case of like, here's the problem I need to solve today. I'm going to do it. Here's the problem I'm going to solve tomorrow. Um, and that, I think, is the biggest difference, I'd say, between, between the two. I want to call out another um perhaps something that overlaps both academia as well as the corporate world. I've heard two different camps in terms of STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. I've heard of STEAM as well with arts thrown in. Yes. So, but when it comes to those disciplines, I've heard one camp say that there just aren't enough people who graduate with these degrees. There just aren't enough people who have this knowledge, who have this experience. We can't hire the folks who don't, who don't exist. It's just impossible. I hear another camp saying that yeah, there are people. We just need to diversify where we look. You know, we need to, to go places that we haven't gone. We need to talk to groups that we haven't normally talked to, industry associations that we haven't normally spoken with. You know, STEM can look very, very monolithic. It looks like it's, you know, one particular type of person. We need to explore. So I'm wondering, from your background, do you think that there is definitely a shortage of experts? Or do you think, you know, we maybe need to expand our search a bit and look in different ways? What, what are your thoughts about that? There's not enough people mm. would be my short answer. The long form answer is there's a general decline. If we take geology, I know engineering may be similar. I'm, you know, but I'll speak to what I know, which is geology. The number, the intake of geology students across the UK and North America is declining. Uh, case in point, the McGill, uh, McGill, I did my PhD at McGill. The year I left, 
they had one undergrad start. And that was a program that used to be like 12 to 15. So you've got an, a decline in people going into university, which means you then have a decline in the output, obviously. Um, and we are also in a point where we need to grow our workforce because we're looking for more minds. So you need even more people than if the intake was, was stable. So there's that. Um, and I also think that, to, to touch on your second point about diversifying where we're finding people, we as an industry, or the industry as a whole, likes to complain that there aren't enough people, but then they're not putting in the effort to go find the people. They're not putting in the effort to engage with, you know, primary school kids or you know, middle school kids, high school kids. You need to convince someone when they're 10 years old that geology is really cool because then they'll go and do it. You know, they'll think about that as they're doing their, their high school degree, you know, diplomas and things. And then that, that's how you... In if you're going to people the year before they're going to go to university and trying to convince them that they're going to do geology, it's too late. That's not... You need to get people early. Um, and then, as you said, you need to diversify where you're finding people. So everyone has a, a role to play, I think, within the industry to do that. And nothing, not enough is being done, um, for sure. We, we talked earlier about, I guess, to speak through some of the character traits that you maybe need to grow, learn, um, grow the muscle, if you will, that resilience is a piece that seems to, to come up um, a lot, particularly in this industry. I'm wondering if there's been a time where you've had either um, some very constructive feedback that at the time really took you to a low place, but now you can't imagine what it would be like to not have that feedback because it played such a role for you. So I'm wondering what that feedback, what the conversation was about, and also how did you take that and turn it into a growth opportunity? I'm always looking for more constructive feedback. Okay, great. <laughs> um, sometimes I feel I don't get enough. I think people are too polite. Um, really? Yeah. Um, In your industry, you said it's about being coldly analytical, but... I'm probably more analytical than most. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, one, uh, I was actually at a leadership course of all places that I was told I was being too much of a leader because um, I was just pushing to like lead the group during a leadership course. And I was like, I need to listen to more people. I need to take in more people's thoughts and opinions and like always... It's that whole, like, you can't necessarily control your first reaction to something or mm -hmm. to any situation, but you can control your second. So, like, my first reaction is always to be like, I need to solve this problem. Yeah. And then it's all about, oh, that second reaction is like, okay, like, don't dive in just yet. Let's, let's listen to everyone's opinions and, and move from there and come up with a plan. Um, so that definitely... Did um, that really take you to a low place for someone to say, hey, we're at this leadership conference, but you need to lead less. Did that really, <laughs> did that really impact you? And it, and it challenge you? Um, yeah, because I always thought I was right. Okay. <laughs> and then I realized okay. that I'm not always right. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, that happened in my early, early to mid 20s okay. when, you know, you think that you know yourself and then you get to your early 30s and you're like, oh, and now I understand who I am as a person. So, how do you course correct that? So, you're there, you thought you knew, you realize there's some growth maybe that needs to take place. What did you do to rectify that? I think just, uh, take a step back in everything and um, yeah it engaged with more people I think during my PhD again I, maybe the skills it, you're working more on your own I think that the that comment and the supervisions during my PhD made me a much better leader when I came into industry afterwards because you you quickly learn you, I realized early on, perhaps before I was even managing people, that everyone is different. You can't treat people the same. And that goes back to being coldly analytical, where I'm like, well, like this is this is how you do it. This is this is plan of action A B C D. Like these are facts done. And then 
remembering that actually you're dealing with humans <laughs> um, uh, humans have feelings um, and so how do we uh, how do I work with people who are all different all diverse all have a different attitude to something and making people feel seen and heard um, and empowered to do something so yeah that's that came to me quite well almost before my career started that I had this realization um, that has certainly like made me a bit more who I am today. If you had the opportunity to have anyone in your inner circle, you know, some people say, hey, you could invite anyone dead or alive to a dinner party, have them in your inner circle, have them in your network, you know, dead or alive, but folks who you really think that you could learn a lot from, just about three or four people, whether they're people from, you know, history, political leaders, business leaders, scientists, innovators, but you feel that you would really be able to learn from, that they could perhaps help you fill gaps. Who would those leaders be? And what gaps might they help you fill? Why would you have them in your community? Good question. Um, I try not to idolize any one person because everyone you know, has their pros and their cons. And um, I don't know if I could list specific people, but you know, again, I'm a scientist, but I find kind of actors and musicians really interesting this is a completely different you know uh field um like reese witherspoon's a perfect example actually you know the, here is someone who is an actor by trade but has like turned the whole business um you know people politicians you know the ones that i disagree with and the ones that i agree with um you know it'd be interesting to have all of them at the dinner table um and yeah, you know, again, you know, musicians as well, people who um, hold a whole lot of power and influence over a group. I think Beyonce and Taylor Swift, who I think are two of the most powerful women on the planet. How do you, how do you stay authentic and, but also use your, your, um, your position and power to empower other people and not put other people down? So. Um, yeah, it would definitely be people that are completely left field of, you know, not necessarily in my industry because I want to understand how I can better interact with people because I, we as an industry, mining notor has a notoriously bad rep, right? Because we have done a really bad job um, of convincing people that we're doing the right thing. We all, you know, everyone in this room knows that mining is necessary for the, the energy transition and um, and all of that. And yet, you know, we're dealing, particularly my generation, you know, I'm 32, are dealing with 50, 100 years of poor mining practices and trying to convince people that actually we should still mine. We're trying to mine in a much better way. Um, we are mining in a much better way. We're not trying, we are doing it. Um, but you need to be able to communicate with people who aren't coldly analytical and, you know, haven't studied geology and know that there's a climate crisis going on and, and all of that. Um, so, yeah, I think having people in completely different fields to yourself and learning from, from them is ways to make yourself more well-rounded. Okay. And you are literally in the trenches. You are, you know, hanging out with the volcanoes and checking out rocks <laughs> to see their birth dates and that sort of thing. Occasionally, yeah. <laughs> Occasionally. <laughs> so if you had to position, and you mentioned that the mining industry is just, you know, not, don't have, they don't have a good brand right now. No. If you were in a position to rebrand, reposition, and kind of lead the charge with the messaging, so what external stakeholders are hearing, what people who know little about mining, but just understand that there is a need for a transition and maybe don't see how mining fits in. If you could change the messaging that they're getting to show what's really going on out there and what the real possibilities are, what would be that messaging to them? I mean, anytime I'm talking to the general public about things like that, whether it be informally or, you know, formally. The moment someone asks, finds out that I studied volcanoes, they're like, oh, I went to this place once or... It got me an upgrade on a plane once. That was great. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> that worked. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's talking people through their days, but making people realize uh, 
there's a total disconnect between where our stuff comes from and you know what we use. So I walk people through their day. I'm like, okay, so you get up in the morning and you turn your light on. You know, light bulbs aren't growing on trees. You go and clean your teeth. There's zinc in your toothpaste. Do you know where zinc comes from? Like, oh, your toothpaste is made of plastic. That's that's oil. Okay. And then, oh, you go and check TikTok and Instagram on your phone. Your phone has two thirds of the periodic table in it. If you lined up all of the waste, e-waste products, you know, old phones, that would be the richest ore, ore anywhere in the world, bar none. Um, and so people start, you know, when you talk about things like this and, and people are like, oh, I get it now. And I'm like, okay, so, you know, we want to electrify 90 million cars a year. Each of those cars has, what, tens of kilograms of lithium in each car has four times more copper than a regular car. But, you know, we can't just, that doesn't just magically appear out of, out of thin air. And then people say, oh, we shouldn't be mining at all, you know. And, and then I'm like, but I have no right to say to people in developing nations that haven't got electricity yet that they don't deserve copper for their pylons because oh we we as the western world and you know messed up the planet 100 100 200 years ago you know it's more about how do we empower those in that that situation electrify those things and and but do it in a much cleaner way um and People often don't have an answer for that, funnily enough, when you're like, well, you know, how do you tell small African nations that they can't have power? Because we need their copper for electric vehicles. It's like, yeah. Um, but it, that it's having those, like, one-to-one -one conversations with people going into schools. I do a lot with a comp uh, fully charged live, which is a YouTube company. They do a lot on electric vehicles. I mean, that's a, that's a friendly audience because people who are big into EVs understand um, but yeah it's, it's, it's getting people to think about where their stuff comes from um, and I think that if mining well, mining starting to do it but pushing that message more um, as well as showcasing what a modern mine looks like um, people you know see think of mining and and think dirty pits and tailings dam spills and all of that and yes that you know Rio Tinto in Australia a few years ago with their um, mess ups with that, some aboriginal like um, historical artifacts you know stuff still happens it's not good and it, does, it puts the entire industry back but it's f far less frequent than it was in the 70s 60s I mean I used to work in Cornwall the mining pits there are now UNESCO World Heritage Sites but it's like that is that is a scar on the landscape, but because it's old and historic, it's you know protected. Um, but real, you know, bringing people into modern minds, opening them up to people so that people can see like what is closure, what is post closure, how do we remediate these situations? Um, particularly with young people who are like, oh, I want to be fixing the planet, I want to, I want to help. This is how you can help. Um, but it requires people to put in the time. You talk about working with youth quite a bit and just really seeing how much promise there could be once interest is peaked. I'm wondering if you um, have thoughts about working with policymakers. Do you think that there is a huge opportunity there um, in the same way there's an opportunity to educate youth to get their involvement so they can you know, make waves in the future. Do you see that same sort of promise with regulations particularly or with policies that can help to evolve the space? Yeah, I think so. You, you're seeing a lot of, you know, critical minerals acts and various things coming up um, from multiple nations, which I think are sometimes, you know, maybe done for the wrong reasons, but it has the right result, right? You know, security of supply is essential for anyone. But it's not, we're not doing that to save the planet, we're doing that to save our own, you know, people's economies. Um, it just happens that it will help the planet. Um, whereas me as a geologist, I'm like, you know, ultimately, my big picture is 
how do we reduce and mitigate the actions of climate change? Um, so I think you do see that change. And I think that change is needed because while some companies will go above and beyond current standards, um, for the most part, the standards are the push. And so you need to push more. And I think it's that combination of incentivizing companies, so pulling them along, being like, well, if you're greener, have some more tax credits, you know, this, that and the other. And also pushing them to be like, this is the bare minimum. In this technology leading in, I always think of drivers as people. You mentioned youth and educating folks, regulation, as well as technology. Do you think technology is where it needs to be, or at least on its way to where it needs to be? It's certainly on its way. Um, you're, it's going to be a combination of human... Uh, human... Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like how, how we act, what we do, how we think about the world combined with technology is the way you're going to mitigate climate. You know, we need less cars on the road. I don't, you know, saying that in a, a lithium, man <laughs> lithium mining conference could be controversial because they, <laughs> but, you know, it's, the, again, it's, the, it's that push-pull. It's like, we need to change how we think and how we live as a society combined with technical, you know, technology that can help us reduce those emissions, be it electric vehicles or, you know, better um, practices in water management, um, you know, recycling and things like that. Um, you could go into all sorts of technologies that are kind of being researched and developed. And that goes back to the university point of, you know, we need academia, we need that research because that's where those, a lot of those ideas, those potential game-changing ideas are born. Um, and just got to hope it happens in time. Wow. So those research institutions, that's where those ideas can really take shape and take form. Also, I love the, the thought about, I got started here because I thought that mountains were magical. I thought that the earth was magical. And also seeing yourself as a problem solver and really getting to know that about yourself. Um, and finally, taking a step back and looking to engage with people more, saying that this is something that maybe I was light on earlier in my career, and now this is something that can help me move forward. Um, how we act, plus our technology, that's the way forward. And personally, what I learned, clay is eroded volcano. Did not know that. Not all clays. Not all clays, okay. Don't, <laughs> don't want to do that, but, you know, <laughs> you know volcanoes are sedimentary deposits for lithium. More often than not, are eroded, eroded volcanoes. So there's your fun fact for the day. The fun fact for the day. And what a wonderful science and life lesson this was. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for joining us. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everyone who's live with us in the Live Lounge, as well as those of you who are joining us via the recording. Don't forget to subscribe to catch up on all of our other episodes. You can find these on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Podbean, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your content. If you want to find out more about other events we run in this space, just head over to the event section at fastmarkets.com. I'm Kisa Shreen. Thank you for joining.